Logan's Run by William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson. Nine. He cat prowls the corridors. He stops in front of the gun wall. Logan's gun is still not there. He paces, waits. He hears a guarded whisper not meant for his ears. Old Francis is on to something, says a voice. They say the cubs cheated him out of a runner. That isn't it. He's on to something. He doesn't react to this. He shadow glides the gray halls. He is a violence, contained. He moves back to the gun wall, stares, moves away. He checks the time, 7.30. Fact, Logan has not returned with his gun. Fact, Logan is on last day. He instructs the techs to rig a gun trace tuned to Logan's weapon. When the gun is fired, it will register its location on the board. He sits, face illuminated by ghost lights from the glowing circuits. He waits. Evening. When Logan walked into his living unit, young Abe Lincoln was there, splitting logs in the center of the room. Logan automatically punched a wall stud, and the president was sucked, hissing, back into the tridim. He stripped, bathed, changed to graze, and dialed a meal and a scotch. Sipping the ice drink, Logan stared at his palm, at the blinking crystal flower. Last day. Twenty-four hours in which to live. Then his flower would go black, and it would be time to turn himself in for sleep. Twenty-four hours. Shit. Logan picked up the silver punch key from the bed. Runners say please. Runners say help. Runners say mercy. Runners say don't. Doyle had said sanctuary. And Logan held a key which might lead to it, to a goal never proved to exist, to a place which could not exist. Not in this world. Not for a runner in 2116. But what if Sanctuary were a reality? A place where runners were safe from the gun? What if he, Logan III, could find it and destroy it in the last 24 hours of his life? His existence would be justified. He'd be a world hero. His life would end in glory. It would be a risk worth taking. And the key to the quest lay in his hand. Do it. Logan walked to the communa deck. The silver key slid easily into the slot. Inside the flat housing, tiny indentations in the stamped metal made electrical connections. The wall screen lightened. A girl invented peekaboos regarded Logan. She was perhaps sixteen with dead, flat eyes. Her body was slim-breasted and angular. Call back later, she said. I'm going out now. I'm calling now, said Logan. Have you got a name? I've got a name. He let it rest at that. A spark of interest in the flat eyes, but you're keeping it to yourself. There's no sanctuary in passing out random identities, said Logan, leaning slightly on the word sanctuary. Her gaze did not flicker. This didn't feel right, not right at all. The runner could have been babbling. Maybe he was acting on a false lead. Who gave you my key? the girl asked. A friend. I'm going out. You said that. To a party. I'm expected. I could meet you there, said Logan. She studied him speculatively. Halstead Complex, West Wing, 4th level. Living Unit 2582. Got that? Logan nodded. I really shouldn't be inviting strangers, she said. If you're not up to the party, I'll be to blame. I'm up to it, said Logan, and anything else. He kept his face impassive. We'll see. She said one last thing before she blacked. I'm Lilith 4. I think you'll find me helpful. Logan let out a breath. It sounded like a word. The word it sounded like was sanctuary. The party in Unit 2582 was getting into full stride when Logan arrived. The door was opened by a mouse-faced man in orange trims. He was quite intoxicated. The tree of cruelty often blooms in the fertile soil of love, he said. I'm sure it does, says Lo said Logan. Eh. Scanning the crowded room for Lilith. The boy seeks... The man finds. That's a poem. I write them, you know. I didn't know, said Logan. The girl was not in the crowd. Perhaps she'd been delayed or had changed her mind about him. One of my poems was read on TD, called Wombwood. Like to hear it? Logan said nothing. In the woods of the womb she walked. In a whirl of red wounds she fell, heart bursting like a plum in the bracelets of her breasts. Logan sat down on a flow couch built into the wall. The poet continued to talk, obviously determined to elicit praise. That poem received a great deal of very favorable comment. I'm quite famous, you know. Fine, said Logan. 
A toad of a man scuttled up with a foaming mug in his hand. Try this, he said. Logan caught the slightly sour odor of fermentation. It's Volney's homebrew. We've got a whole keg of it. It's nothing like the beer from the slots. He's a real artist, Volney is. Puts musk raisins in it. I prefer scotch. That's your loss, citizen. Logan dialed a scotch. It was taken him by, from him by a red-haired girl in slash velvets. She downed it hurriedly. Wonderful, she said. Her green eyes were alcohol-flushed. She offered Logan a cigarette. No thanks. Don't be afraid to, she urged him. There's a police payoff in this area. No tobacco raids. Go ahead. No thanks. The girl took offense. Afraid to smoke, aren't you? You men, cowards. Every one of you cowards. I was on pair-up with a merchant man until last week. Then we broke it. Know why? Why, said Logan. Because. Because he lacked the essentials. He was content. Content to be content. He had his business and he had me, and that's all he wanted. I need a man who wants what he doesn't have. That makes sense to you, citizen? Maybe you don't need a man. Maybe you need a boy. Oh, jeez. Oh. I tried a boy. Eleven. He was good for a while, but I got so I hated his young face. I'm fifteen, and a woman needs a man. How old are you? Old enough, said Logan, keeping his right hand closed. The flower blinked warmly, warmly in palm flesh. He could feel its heat against his fingertips. How about a pair-up? No, no thanks. The green eyes chilled. Is that all you can say? No, thanks. The girl stood up, weaved away. Logan sighed. Where was Lilith? The door slid open and a fat-bellied man eased in, bearing a double armload of clothing and accessories. His voice shrilled in a falsetto. Hail, fellow lung blasters and glass masters and life fasters. Hail, fellow peepers, the gear is here. The, fast man, the fat man pasted a talk puppet grin on his face and began strutting the room in high pumping steps. Gear up, everybody gear up. <sighs> Been waiting long? One of the four grinned down at Logan. A pink cigarette dangled smoke from her glitter-coated lips. She was bare-hoped in silver snakeskins. Let's talk, said Logan. You know why I'm here. The fat man bustled importantly up to them. He thrust a black net body stocking and creep stretch soles at them. Get up, you two, he said, clapping his meaty hands. Let's peep. We'll be partners, declared Lilith. You said you were up to it. Logan took the clothing, moved to a change room, and slipped out of his graze. He'd have to stow the gun somewhere, no place to conceal it in the skin-tight bodysuit. At least he'd left the spare ammo packs in his unit, fearing that the six charges in his weapon should see him through. Now he was grateful for this decision, less bulk to worry about. He slipped the gun into an alcove, gambling that no one would have occasion to search the closet. "'You have Greek shoulders,' said the mouse-faced poet, who was beginning to gear up next to him. Logan grunted and returned to Lilith, who was already dressed and ready. She offered him a scotch. Thanks, I can use this. He tipped the glass to his lips. A dozen dark-garbed men and women waited in the central chamber. They joined them, and the girl handed Logan a pair of smoke goggles. Wear these on the ledge. Six black light cameras were arranged neatly on a table. One camera per couple. Righty, righty, said the fat man, signaling for attention. Now all you peepers know what to do. Stop being a damn woman's sharps, said a bored voice, and get on with it. Sharps glanced petulantly at the speaker. I'm in charge. The cameras belong to me. And it's your alcohol and your tobacco and your living unit, for which we are all duly grateful. So let's peep. Sharps made an obscene gesture. He waved the first couple off. In pairs, the players left the chamber through a ceiling-high view window. <sighs> wow. Logan found himself kneeling beside Lilith on a narrow ledge high in the complex. Below them, the great city was alive with snakes of light. He saw the rows of blinking glasshouses near Hurley Square and beyond the dazzle of arcade. The fire galleries sent up their rose glow, staining the edge of the night sky. It was a long way down. He shifted the camera and gripped the alum, ribbed uh, alum ribbing of the building wall. I hate it when they put those hyphens in the middle of a word. Wind slicked between the box beams, threatening to pull him from the ledge. Lilith crawled into a liquid dark, edging in front of Logan. Keeping his eye on the feminine sway of her dark bottom, he followed. When the girl stopped, he said, Talk. We're alone now. He couldn't see her face behind the goggles. First we peep, she said. Then we talk. Why not now? If we return to the party without film, they'll suspect something. Sharps is not the fool he seems. They'll ask questions we might not want to answer. 
High in the complex, a full half mile above them, a police paravane ran its pin light along the ledges. Keep in shadow, said Lilith. They patrol these landings. We have to be careful. Logan knew the game was illegal, and he didn't want the police stopping him. If he got picked up without the gun, he would not be able to prove his identity. They'd have to check him out. If he had the gun and revealed himself, the girl would close the door on Sanctuary. Either way, he couldn't afford to be stopped. He'd be careful. With the cat's litheness, the girl swung, hand over hand, along a guy wire ne leading to the next ledge. Logan slung the camera over one shoulder and followed. Most of the windows they could reach were blacked. Other units were unoccupied. Lilith pointed downward. I think something's happening in there, she said. The window she'd indicated was closed, but not blacked. The girl took out a slim wire with an earplug at one end and a wall cup at the other. She pressed the cup against the building, the plug in her ear. She smiled. Have a listen, she said, passing the earplug to Logan. Through the miniature amplifier, he could hear voices husky with love, a man and woman, sighs, the rub of skin on skin. Give me the camera, whispered Lilith, and grab my ankles. I'm going down for a shot. Logan braced himself. He clung to the girl's legs as she slipped off the ledge, head first. Lilith dangled in space just in front of the dark window. Below her, a mile deep emptiness, the stagger of steel and glass and box beam units. Logan leaned back, feet gripping the stone, feeling his leg muscles protest. The camera whirred. Up, the girl whispered. He pulled her back to the ledge. How did you know I could hang on to you? I didn't, she said. That's part of the lift. Did she really know anything about Sanctuary? Or was she simply some danger sick female out for thrills? Logan didn't know. Yet. A pin light raked the building. Police. They melted into shadow. The patrol paravane ghosted past them and continued on its way. We're doing fine, the girl said. Can't we talk now? She laughed and crawled off with Logan behind her. They climbed upwards along ridged metal, their suction stretch soles aiding the ascent. On the roof, Lilith said, jump. She leaped into a space, cleared a gap between units, and landed in a garden patio. He made the jump, almost losing his balance. The patio was deserted. On the adjoining level, however, the girl found fresh prey. You take them this time, she said to Logan. He aimed the camera, fingered in into whirring motion. Good, said the girl. That's prime peeping. Now we, now we talk, or I pitch you over this ledge. I've had enough of your nonsense. You'd really do it, wouldn't you? Her voice held excitement. I really would. All right. What do you know about Sanctuary? I know it's where I want to go. Where did you get my key? She watched him carefully. His lips felt loose. He giggled foolishly. From, from the same place all runners get theirs. He giggled again. What was happening to him? The hard aluminum ledge rippled, fell away. He was floating out in space with the wind crying around him. Answer the question, the girl's voice whispered intensely at his ear. Logan found himself singing. Angerman was filled with fury, he the judge and he the jury. Logan babbled happily. He was poised in air, looking down at himself sprawled on the ledge. He watched Lilith cuff him across the mouth. He watched her grab his hair and bend his head back. The key! Where did you get the key? Men named ten, named ten, named ten, named Doyle Ten. Logan's neck aced, ached. Angerman, pursuing faster, he sang. Ang, ang, anger man, the angry master. He stood up rigidly with the girl clinging to him. The world was no longer dark. It was filled with blazing orange music which stabbed his eyes. Did you kill Doyle? The orange music stroked him. Cubs, cubs killed him. Logan stepped off the ledge. Instinctively, he reached out. His clawing fingers found a grip. His head was clearing as he kicked at air. His right foot lodged on a metal projection, and slowly, inch by inch, he drew himself back onto the ledge. He lay, stomach down, gasping for breath. The girl, she drugged his scotch, with truth tell. Had he told her too much? What now? he asked. Go see Doc, she said sweetly. He's your next contact. Doc who? In Arcade. Look for the new you. That's his place. Logan nodded. Now we go back to Sharps and turn in our peeps. Some lift, eh? Sure, said Logan. Some lift. He left the belt at the Beverly Overpass and began threading his way through Arcade. The immense pleasure center formed a never-ending human logjam. Arcade had not closed its doors to fun seekers for over 50 years. The place was a vast, crazy quilt of hallucin mills, relive parlors, and fire galleries. Signs that screamed and moaned in smoky colors. Relive that first embrace. A gaudy tridem on a ribbed platform depicting two nude youngsters in a torrid tangle. 
relive those precious moments. A wild-eyed boy riding a flame devil stick through a mock sky. Relive, relive, relive. Noise gonged, a thousand odors mingled. Hawkers cried their wares. Here night was day and day was night. Want a good time, citizen? A man with one arm and a fog voice beckoned him towards a swinging door. Logan passed him quickly. He saw the sign he was looking for. It hit the window in a sulfurous shower and withdrew. Hit with hit and withdrew into the darkness behind the black glass. The new you. The new you. The new you. Logan entered the shop. The waiting room was the color of ashes, and scattered pieces of furniture were faded, worn. Even the air in the room seemed used. An ancient chrome-plated desk hutched in one corner, and behind it sang a young woman sat a young woman in soiled whites. Her face was pale and predatory. She regarded Logan suspiciously. You want Doc? I want Sanctuary. The girl wet her lips with a small pink tongue. Then you want Doc. She rose listlessly, crossed to Logan. Hand, she said. He held up his right hand, palm out. Red, black, red, black, red, black. Come on, she said. Follow through for the new you. She led him down a musty hallway and into a large room smelling of metal. Logan recognized the thing in the center of the alum floor. He felt himself ice up. Table. The machine loomed over a flat metal bed that was grooved and slotted and equipped with fastening devices. There's not another like her outside a hospital between here and New, Me New Alaska, said a harsh, confident voice. Logan whirled to face a thick-bodied 16-year-old. A man's bony features were split by a crooked-toothed smile. He wore a long gray smock which extended down to his shoe tops. Doc. A little edgy, are you? Well, that's natural. Runners are scared people. At least you got enough sense to start before your flower blacks. It's tougher, then, with the sandman onto you. What'll it be? Face job or full body? Could add a couple inches to those legs. Just the face, said Logan. Got no time, is it? Runners never got time. A note of sad regret in the voice. I won't ask your name. I don't want to know it. You got the punch key, and that's good enough for me. Ballard knows who to give them to. Ballard, Logan's mind leaped. The world's oldest man, a story to frighten children with, a legend, a subject for folk chants. Was there actually such a man, the force behind Sanctuary? Holly will get you ready. If you're worried about the table, don't be. They call me Doc, but I'm a trained mech, a real mechanic. Give me a basket of transistors and a pound of platinum sponge and I can make anything. You're in good hands, believe what I tell you. As he talked, the girl came forward to unbutton the collar of Logan's shirt. The gun was stuffed into his waistband, and he wondered if they want all his clothes off. Hiding the gun would be impossible here. Ask me what I'm doing in a shop like this if I'm so handy. I got my reasons. I make out. A little muscle for the cubs, a sex lift now and then, a face job for Ballard. Maybe a body change for some sick citizens who's tired of himself. Adds up. I do all right. The girl was brushing her fingertips lightly down Logan's arm. There was a deep blue spark in her eye. I'm Holly, she said softly. Holly 13. In ancient times, they said my number was unlucky. Do you believe in luck? Doc aimed another crooked smile at Logan. Holly don't work for money. She gets her lift out of watching the table. And other things. His smile became a dry chuckle. Back in a minute. Do I need to undress? Logan asked the girl. Not for a face, she said. That is, not unless you want to. What now? Empty your pockets. She led him to the table. It was one of the big brutes, a Mark J. Surgeon. Suspended over the flatbed was a glittering tangle of probes and pincers and scalpels, springs, clamps, and needles. Tubes and looped wires interconnected from one part of the table to another, crisscrossing the main body which contained the solid-state circuitry forming a machine's memory center and brain. At one end was a console of buttons and switches, lights and dials. A table such as this could lengthen bone and change dental patterns. It could broaden shoulders, put on or take off weight. It could alter germplasm or blood groupings. With its infinitely adjustable lasers, it could lay back the flesh surrounding a single nerve and lift out that nerve without nicking the sheath. It was as precise as a diamond cutter and as unemotional as a vending slot. And that's where we're going to stop for tonight.